Uh, this conference uh, will now be recorded. And, and as you've just heard, it's, we're now recorded. Any any comments you want to put in the in the chat, please ask away, and we'll we'll take questions at the end. Peter, is that okay? No problem at all. Okay. All right. I'll I'll switch myself off screen now. Okay. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you very much, David, and thank you to everybody else for joining to hear my presentation this lunchtime. So as David has already kindly introduced me on a number of occasions over the past five minutes. Um, I am going to very quickly repeat that for those people who've just joined. My name is Pete Stevens. I'm the Applications Development Manager for Taram Geosynthetics. Uh, civil and structural engineer by training, a couple of decades uh, post-graduation. Um, I think I would say I, I very much am an expert these days in, in geosynthetic materials. I am not an expert in rail applications. Uh, I've had a, a fair degree of experience over the past few years with the uh, current business. So please excuse me if I do make the odd uh, error using uh, the wrong terminology. Uh, I hope you'll find this useful and beneficial. As David said, if you have some questions, please pop them in the chat uh, and I'll pick those up at the end. I'll also pop my contact details there as well. I gave uh, this presentation to the, uh, or on behalf of the International Geosynthetic Society in February of this year. Um, so I've basically used the same set of slides. Uh, it is uh, a presentation that we generally try to remove, remove a lot of commercial content. So I've generally used uh, generic descriptions to describe some of these products um, to avoid making this overly uh, commercial. So um, very, very quickly, um, who are Taram? Um, so Taram is actually a brand name. Uh, my company is called Fiberweb Geosynthetics and we're part of a big global manufacturing business called Berry. Uh, Taram has been established for uh, over 50 years now, um, and I'm going to put up a little bit of information, a little bit of excuse the pun track history. I'll try to avoid that because I'm sure you've probably uh, heard that on many occasions. Uh, we are the uh, UK brand leader in terms of uh, geotextiles, um, the most specified geotextile um, in, in the market in the UK. Um, we distribute, we manufacture in the UK, we distribute mainly to the UK, into Europe, and, and some of our products go globally as well. Uh, as a manufacturer, we're part of the risk scheme, and all of the products that we manufacture for use in permanent wear applications have network rail product acceptance and approval, and obviously a TFL, although it's a slightly different uh, approval process. Okay, that's enough about my, my company, Taram. Uh, as I said, I'm basing this on a presentation which I delivered a couple of months ago to the, uh, the IGS, the International Geosynthetic Society. So this is um, a little bit uh, on the history of both the IGS and a little bit on UK Rail, just to see where the, the dates align. I've also um, popped in one on the Permanent Way Institution as well, just to get a bit of context. I'm going to give you a, a, an introduction to geosynthetic materials, essentially what are they, what they do. Um, I'm then going to drill down uh, into looking at three problems uh, that you might encounter uh, in permanent way applications and some solutions which geosynthetics can be used uh, within. Uh, in those solutions, I'll in illustrate some of the testing that's been done on the products and pick out a few case studies, uh, some quite historic case studies, which is still very relevant today in terms of the information which they gave us uh, about how effective geosynthetics can be to, to help and address problems on the rail. I will take a little bit of time to talk about what the benefits of using geosynthetics are uh, and illustrate that with some slides and then a brief overall summary. So I've got about 60 slides, so um, I'll do my very best to get through those in about 45 minutes. Um, and uh, please uh, stay with me, um, and I hope you find this helpful and useful. So a little bit of track history. I've got three slides with a few dates on, or key dates really, just illustrating 
uh, a little bit of the, the history, uh, specifically in the UK. Um, so starting back in 1818, um, I say I delivered this actually as a joint presentation between the Institute of Civil Engineers and the uh, International Geosynthetic Society. So right back to 1818, um, you can see uh, Thomas Telford there. Um, by 1825, the first commercial uh, rail line was put in, the Stockton and Darlington Railway, steam locomotive, photograph at the bottom showing that on ballasted tracks, uh, not steel rails at that time. Um, for those who are interested, the first steel rails went in in Derby Station in 1857. Um, I've just popped in when your institution was formed, 1884, Permanent Way Institution. Um, I'm certainly not going to cover all of the, the various things that occurred over in, in that time, but certainly between 1884 and uh, the sort of turn of the, um, the, the century, um, it was a heyday for rail. And by around 1914, there was in the order of 20,000 uh, linear meters of track throughout the UK or throughout the British Isles. Um, initially, those were very, a lot of independently owned. Um, there was a series of amalgamations. A lot of this was catalyzed by not just the First World War, but particularly the Second World War, um, got reduced down to about four main companies. And then um, in 1948, um, British Rail became established, essentially bringing together all of those um, separate companies that owned various elements of privatised railways. 1950s uh, saw diesels and electric trains be introduced. Um, and unfortunately, what we also saw um, was then a huge push um, to use of, um, of, of road systems. And a lot of movement of freight particularly started to go onto the motorway networks, moving away from rail, an awful lot less use um, of the rail system. And by the early 60s, uh, the rail network um, was in a bit of a crisis in that the maintenance costs far, far outstripped um, the revenue that was being generated from their use. Um, so uh, this is certainly before my time, but I understand the, uh, the, the Beaching report um, recommended the closure of significant amounts of track and stations, um, as you can see on those figures there, um, allowing the network to really survive because it still had to uh, at least um, break even. Um, so that's a little bit on, on British Rail. Um, and then by uh, 1970, as I outlined, the first um, commercial geotextile was launched, and that was that was Taram, a non-woven geotextile. Uh, so first commercially manufactured and supplied in 1970, so over 50 years ago. 1976, first high-speed train um, in, in, in Britain. Um, 1980, geogrids, tensile geogrids were first launched in 1980. In fact, there's a, a, a wonderful piece in Tomorrow's World, uh, which you can see uh, a, a, an amazing a little video clip. You can see it on YouTube now showing geogrids first um, being, uh, being used at Silkstone Colliery, um, both for reinforced soil and also uh, for stabilization. By 1983, uh, the International Geosynthetic Society was formed. And then just moving now into the, to the last sort of 30 odd years, 1990s saw the use of geocells, um, bottom left hand picture illustrating a geocell being used in Northumberland. And um, 1994, um, whether you kind of think this was a good thing or not, extensive privatization of the, uh, of the rail network um, resulting in uh, a company called Railtrack being responsible, a private company called Railtrack being responsible for maintenance um, of the rail network. Um, the first uh, geotextile specification coming out in 1996 and uh, a relatively cataclysmic event, um, Hatfield derailment in 2000, um, sadly resulting in, in, uh, in death. Um, and um, significant issues with um, 
checking of cracks in rails throughout the network in that period by rail track. Um, a privatized company, huge costs associated with that, uh, resulting um, in 2001, um, them uh, basically uh, going into receivership and their assets and the company then being incorporated by relatively newly formed Network Rail. Uh, so here we are now. And uh, so 20 odd years later, Network Rail now being responsible for um, the management of the, the British um, railway network system. And then a final little milestone there, 2010, saw the commercial introduction of uh, sand blanket replacement geocomposites. And I'll put you a few more slides on about what those products are and what they do in a bit. Um, so that's your kind of quick snapshot track history, bringing in a little bit of some of the significant milestones, both for geosynthetic materials uh, and some of those within the, uh, the current British network rail system. Um, I understand in the order of currently about 10,000 miles of track, so about 50% less than there would have been uh, approximately 100 years ago. Continued drive for lower maintenance, lower costs, lower carbon footprint, and certainly a lot of demand for resilience, building in more resilience for issues such as climate change, as is indicating in that picture at the bottom there. Um, so what I wanted to do is to just take this opportunity to give you a very brief introduction to geosynthetic materials. And then I'm going to go on to talk about how those geosynthetic materials are used in track formation to address some of those issues related to um, lower maintenance costs, extending the life of track and building in more resilience. So what's a geosynthetic material? Um, well, if we just break down the word, um, the geo bit, it's a made up word. I say it was made up back in the 1970s. Geo bit means it's simply in the ground and synthetic means it's made from artificial materials. Um, if we want the ISO definition, it's as it says there. The way I like to describe it is it's a generally flat material. Most geosynthetics are rolled materials, as is illustrated on these photographs. There's the odd exception, such as geocells. Um, flat materials, relatively lightweight, and they, uh, they go geo derived from Greek meaning earth. Thank you, Constantine. That's appreciated. Um, and the geosynthetic materials basically help us to <laughs> increase um, the design life of those natural materials that we're using. So the rock, the earth, the soil, in either make them work more efficiently or make them last a lot longer. In terms of the functions of geosynthetics, um, they have been extended a bit. It's kind of overcomplicating a little bit. There is a debate whether reinforcement and stabilization are kind of the same thing. Um, but these are the ISO definitions um, of what a geosynthetic does. And as, as an engineer, it's useful to see well, what do we want it to do? What do we want it to achieve? And that helps us then select the right product for the particular application, depending on what those conditions are. So generally speaking, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight um, functions of geosynthetic materials. So picture tells a thousand words, just going to very briefly run through those functions and an illustration of a geosynthetic material. So basic um, and actually in fact 60 to 70 percent of all geosynthetics are made are used for separation geotextiles. What is a geotextile? It's a geosynthetic material that's permeable. So it allows generally water to pass through it, um, but retains finer materials. Um, in the short term, that's very helpful in terms of ensuring that we don't get a loss of material. It helps substantially in a rail application by keeping ballast uh, clean of fouling. Um, and also certainly in applications away from rails, such as uh, unsurfaced roads, the use of a separation geotextile can massively extend their design life by ensuring we maintain the separation between the compacted granular materials um, and soft grounds. So in terms of design life, they can extend the design lives of unsurfaced roads by many, many factors, not just a few, uh, a few factors, um, many, many decades. 
beyond what they would expect. Um, another function is filtration. So uh, we're trying to keep, as a typical example there, of incredibly fouled ballast, um, completely contaminated with cohesive material, uh, with clay um, there. And geotextiles can be used very effectively to provide a filtration function, as is demonstrated in that trench there. So rather than having to use um, different layers from small moving up to very large particles um, of granular material, we can now use a single size drainage material in the trench, encapsulate it with a non-woven permeable geotextile providing that filtration function. If we want to be pedantic, it's actually providing a catalyst um, to a, a natural um, a formation just upstream of the geotextile. But for the purposes of this, it's, it's providing the filtration. Um, drainage. Uh, what do I mean by additional drainage? Well, I say again, picture tells a thousand words. Um, as a, a approximate rule of thumb, if we have a 300 mil layer of nice clean drainage aggregate, we can actually replace that with a geocomposite material in the order of about six millimeters thick, and it will give a similar amount of flow capacity. And we're not talking about storage, but just talking about flow capacity. So the two pictures illustrate there the difference where you can basically substitute quite a thick layer of drainage stone for a high flow geocomposite that can improve drainage flow. Reinforcement, uh, I would argue this is the sexy bit of geosynthetic materials. So here we've got horizontal layers of geogrid reinforcement, reinforcing um, that, that, that fill material. Now that my fill material will be potentially marginal fills um, and certainly would not be capable of sitting at such a steep angle. And in fact, it is possible to form vertical or close to vertical retaining structures using geogrid reinforcement and usually a, a hard facing segmental block system, as exam for example. But basically we can be using much more marginal materials. We can be using reclaimed aggregates. We can be using materials with very high cohesive contents and we can make them stand up at unbelievably steep angles. So by providing that reinforcement to the soil blocks as indicated there, so horizontal layers of geogrids. Um, as a nice example, um, just kind of illustrating how a geogrid can be used for stabilization. So essentially the um, granular material interlocks with the geogrid and provides this composite structure. So the geogrid actually stabilizing the granular material and stopping it from moving apart. Very, very useful in soft ground conditions and actually can seriously show conservation and a reduction in those uh, imported granular materials by using geogrid um, to provide stabilization or, or geocells in, in certain situations. Um, membranes, geomembranes sit within geosynthetics. I'm certainly not going to talk about geomembranes for this particular application in terms of trap formations generally not used very much, um, but that's a, a very good example of how a geomembrane can be used in environmental engineering applications. Very simple example there of a water holding lagoon, but can be used for landfill applications, used extensively in landfill, uh, in mining operations to protect the environment from the spillage of harmful uh, contaminants. And obviously those geomembranes need to be protected. So this is an example of a heavy, robust geotextile providing protection to that geomembrane. Um, and then the final one, but also just as significant and some nice examples there of how geosynthetic materials are used um, to provide erosion protection and in conjunction with a lot of other stabilization uh, systems. So. Um, erosion control um, on the surface and as I say in conjunction with things like soil nails. So um, that was a, a bit of a, a quick overview of geosynthetic materials and now uh, I'm going to spend some time talking about um, track bed construction and uh, how geosynthetic materials can be used within the formation to address a, a number of different problems associated specifically with ballasted track. Um, so uh, this is going to be revision for everybody here, so I'm sure I don't need to go into much detail of the basic components, steel rails, sleepers, 
ballast um, and then uh, blanket stroke sub ballast and obviously our, our, our subgrade layers. Um, just a quick a quick overview um, here in terms of the main two types of um, construction. Uh, ballasted track is, is obviously um, ex have been extensively used for, for, for you know many many years, many decades, uh, centuries really. Um, relatively low investment compared to hard slab track construction, um, and as it says there, easy to lay, uh, tends to have higher maintenance. Um, particularly in poor ground conditions, um, does provide good drainage in terms of the ballast itself, but drainage can cause, or poor drainage can cause significant problems. Um, tends to be around a 20 year design life, approximately. Some people might argue with me on that one. Um, speed limited, and certainly much, much higher speeds are capable with uh, slab track construction, which is certainly why uh, the vast majority of HS1 and HS2 works are on slab, slab track construction, um, and there are other things to consider uh, as well, as some of the limits with ballasted track in terms of speed. Um, so this presentation is very much focused on ballasted track um, and whether geosynthetics can be used um, within ballasted track. There are uh, situations where certain elements of geosynthetics can be used uh, within slab, slab track construction, um, but certainly in terms of the filtration separation functions, more relevant to, to ballasted track applications. Um, so um, maintenance, uh, maintenance is, is, is the big key. Um, it's firstly, we have this uh, layer of, of ballast material, uh, which has a very, when new, very high void ratio in the order of about 40%. Um, interlocks really well together um, and provides um, provides this this platform that's relatively easy to maintain. It's all about stiffness. It's providing uh, a good elastic bed so that as the loads come on, um, the track deflects, um, but then will recover. And we would see a small amount of deflection, but what we want to do is to try and minimise that amount of deflection um, and uh, extend the uh, the periods of, of uh, tamping operations, as it's shown here, as high as possible. Uh, tamping operations actually can create uh, dust as a result of the huge pressures involved in tamping the ballast back underneath the sleepers. So it, it in itself can cause issues with creating fine particles within the ballast, contaminating it more, uh, compromising the ballast in terms of its drainage capacity. Uh, and contributing towards fouling ballast. So what we want to do is to try and extend those maintenance periods as much as is practically possible so that we don't have to have uh, speed limits as shown there and uh, issues with track geometry, etc. cetera. Um, so what I'm just gonna kind of illustrate here is a few problems um, on ballasted track and some solutions which incorporate geosynthetic materials. So um, I know these are not all of the trap problems, um, but a little snapshot, um, subgrade pumping, severe um, clay slurry uh, migration into ballast, top left. Um, bottom left, poor drainage. Um, as soon as we have water uh, within uh, any type of granular material or cohesive material standing water, it causes uh, a degradation in strength and that can uh, affect therefore the performance of the ballast layer and the elasticity of the ballast layer. Um, top right, um, they're showing essentially a too thin ballast layer um, and the, the, the forces uh, causing attrition and abrasion of the ballast and that white dust there showing essentially ballast abrasion. Very, very soft subgrade uh, formations can be very problematic and you can potentially see you know, deep-seated subgrade failures. Um, so very soft um, soft uh, subgrade formations can be an issue. Um, possible causes of these problems, as I said there, very soft, weak, variable ground conditions, insufficient drainage as I've mentioned, severe subgrade erosion, um, et cetera, et cetera. You can read the list. Um, so um, can geosynthetics solve these problems? Um, yes, uh, they can certainly be um, used um, in part of the solution and sometimes can be the main solution. 
um, going through the list. Sand blanket replacement geocomposites with reinforcing geogrids, top left picture there. Geogrids providing ballast stabilization. Um, simple application, but drainage trench liners, as I showed earlier, can be very effective at helping to keep fine materials out of drainage trench and GSLs providing sub ballast stabilization. So I'm just going to pick out um, a few of those and just talk through um, some case studies and some examples in terms of some of the testing that's been done. Um, geosynthetic track formation products are well established. Um, these illustrate the five core PW uh, products for Taram geosynthetics. Um, so a standard separation geotextile uh, top left, a uh, couple of robust um, geotextiles, separators, and one with enhanced drainage function, geogrid and geotextile reinforcing and separating geocomposites, uh, and then more recently, the sand blanket replacement geocomposite, such as Hybritex. Um, I'm not going to go through this one in detail. I'm going to just leave a few of these slides up for reference if people want to go back and refer to them. So this is more of a comprehensive overview, and there are additional products in there, such as GSLs for stabilization. So in terms of the geosynthetic materials shown on the left and the functions and what we're actually trying to achieve in the middle. Um, so going back to my first my first problem, um, wet beds. Um, so very uh, severe erosion um, of the uh, subgrade being shown here. Um, clay pumping uh, causing a clay slurry um, passing up through the ballast. Um, the, the issues are that firstly it, it's stopping the, the drainage function, um, but it only requires a relatively small percentage of contamination with a with a, a cohesive with fine material and um, for that ballast layer to start behaving in a plastic way rather than an elastic way so as soon as we see that cohesive contamination within the ballast layer we then don't see the recovery um, after the loading and that then results in considerable more um, maintenance intervals to try and restore the geometry of the track um, so historically, the solution would have been uh, a substantial layer uh, of sand blinding um, and uh, going back to sort of the 1960s, 1970s in certain areas that might be as much as 300 millimetres thick. Um, so yes, it worked, it provided that pre-filtering, it kept the clay slurry out of the, the, the sub ballast and the ballast layers, uh, but it's obviously a very, very expensive solution. So. I hope everyone can still see this uh, little image here. So this is just describing essentially the approach with the geosynthetic solution. So here we've got our, our water illustrating our ballast. Um, there's our, our train coming over and causing this dynamic cyclic loading um, through the ballast and onto the subgrade. And now we're seeing our clay slurry forming, migrating up through the ballast and then causing this deformation plastic deformation and, and obviously that settlement is then reflected through up to the track. So there's our geosynthetic solution. Um, geotextile separator and uh, sand blanket. I'll come back to your question, Patrick. It's just flashed up in a minute, but I'll, I'll pick that up at the end if that's okay. Um, so this is the geosynthetic solution that would have been adopted from about the 1980s onwards and in a number of conditions this is still appropriate and is still used. Um, so 100 mil sand blinding layer it will depend on uh, the existing uh, the existing blanket um, as to how much sand blinding layer requires to be installed it does depend on the underlying conditions if there's a uh, a history of, of wet bleds, um, but there's your 100 mil sun blinding layer going in, obviously very extensive uh, operation. Your geotextile separator uh, illustrated here in the top right here showing the ballasting operation. Um, so this is a, a solution um, that has been well established now, uh, as I say, since the 1980s and really up to uh, about uh, 11, 12 years ago. Um, before we introduced uh, sand blanket replacement geocomposites. So sand blanket, uh, sand blanket replacement geocomposites such as Taram Hydrotex uh, were introduced 
approximately 11 years ago. And this is showing uh, some of the initial laboratory testing um, to see if we could make these geocomposite materials essentially provide the same function as a combined geotextile and sand layer. Um, so what these geocomposites consist of is a micro filter core, so a, a core material that's capable of filtering out cl clay particles in suspension while still allowing uh, water molecules to pass through. So this was some of the early testing um, back in, in 2011 um, of, uh, of Taram Hydrotex. And if I just walk you through this slide, this sort of shows you the before and after. So um, the top, the top left there is showing this, uh, you know, this this uh, subgrade um, which which will produce clay slurry without a doubt. Um, so the geocomposite was placed on top of that and then subjected to this cyclic loading. And then the um, the top, uh, obviously the geocomposite ballast. Um, the top right hand picture there showing. Uh, after the test, um, partial removal of some of the ballast stone, showing the water having been squeezed up through the geocomposite, but uh, with very little in the way of contamination. Um, bottom left picture showing all of the ballast being removed after the completion of the test and water having passed up through the geocomposite. Um, and the right hand picture is showing that water then being poured away and showing the desiccated um, formation. So this gave us um, really a good indication that these geocomposite, sand blanket uh, replacement geocomposites were very effective at um, separating out those fine clay particles that would conventionally pass through a conventional geotextile. I wouldn't recommend you drink the water, but that's an indication of the water that's passed through the material what's filtering out the fine clay particles. Um, so uh, sand blanket replacement geocomposites um, have been installed um, for approximately 10 years in uh, elements with severe subgrade erosion uh, conditions. This is an example of a, of a project at Monks Lane uh, installed in 2013. Um, this is a cutting, um, about four meter uh, cutting. So there were some issues with water here and standing water on the track. But as you can see with the bottom right hand picture, that's your, your severe issues with uh, with clay slurry contamination of the ballast. Um, so the there was an awful lot of maintenance having to be done in this particular section. So this um, this the treatment here uh, was an excavation of 200 millimeters of of the fouled and contaminated ballast. Uh, sand banket replacement geocomposite went in with a geogrid over the top and 200 millimeters of clean ballast. Um, and this is showing the, uh, the, uh, the results of the displacement um, pre-renewal, uh, uh, one week and then five months afterwards. So essentially what you can see is very clearly um, substantial reductions in displacement um, before the after after the after the installation of the sand blanket replacement geocomposite and the geogrid, um, be very useful to see how this one is uh, performing as well now. But sometimes we don't always get to see uh, everything where the uh, where the where the materials are supplied into. Um, but this is just showing the next stage essentially in terms of the laboratory testing. Um, so this is 2014 and big rig testing at Birmingham University. Um, so this is essentially looking to firstly simulate a little bit more realistically what the small rig did uh, on a larger scale. Um, so if I showed you the cross section. So here we've got a soft formation with the geocomposite um, uh, over the top, sand blanket replacement geocomposite over the top, ballast um, sleepers. Um, and in terms of the loading, very, very significant loadings, 3.8 million cycles um, and loads of up to, uh, well, cyclic loading of up to 125 kilonewtons. Um, very uh, aggressive, abrasive conditions, looking to, to simulate the, the real sort of uh, aspects and, and the abrasive, abrasive conditions. Um, and um, whilst I, I'm not going to go into great details uh, about all of the results of the test, uh, other than to say this was essentially how the formation looked at the end. So essentially replicated 
very well uh, what the small scale test showed, which was um, no uh, subgrade erosion, um, no pumping through of the uh, of the, the fine clay particles and actually it's like this sort of desiccating effect suggesting that in the right ground conditions um, this would give potential improvement in subgrade strength. Um, one thing that is worth mentioning about these um, anti-clay pumping geocomposites is that they should be used in well uh, well drained ground conditions generally um, if they're completely poor drainage and submerged conditions, uh, they will not work effectively. Um, so care has to be taken in terms of where they are used. There is guidance in TRK4239 about where it's appropriate for use. Um, but if we start looking at uh, the benefits, um, sand blanket replacement geocomposites are quicker to install than sand blinding. It kind of stands to reason, really. Um, if you're putting in a 100 mil layer of sand blinding um, in a 24 hour period, um, you're talking at least 100% quicker. Um, and then when we start multiplying that up, we start thinking about the lorry movements. Obviously, we're talking about very difficult to access locations. One lorry load, 20 ton of sand, will treat about 30 millimeters of track. One lorry load of sand blanket replacement gear composite will treat over one kilometre of track. And I can put that slide the other way around. Um, in terms of lorry movements, 40 lorry movements of sand versus one lorry of the um, sand blanket replacement gear composite. Um, we wouldn't, I wouldn't be talking about these if there wasn't a cost saving. There are cost savings in using uh, these materials. Um, one thing I would mention again is just to stress that we're talking about micro filters here. So we are talking about almost semi permeable materials. Um, they're not anywhere near the permeability of a standard geotextile. Although they have a geotextile wrapping and protecting them on the top and the bottom, the inner core is, is a micro filter. So uh, again, the permeability is quite low on them. Um, we try to maximize that as much as, as, as is possible. Um, but this is another interesting statistic, and this is purely just some very simple carbon calculations looking at the cost of construction in terms of carbon cost. Um, this is not even talk about the life cycle and the, and the life cycle assessment. Um, so carbon savings for a sand blanket replacement gear composite versus 100 mil of sand blinding in the order of about 20%. But certainly, in terms of long-term durability, that's likely to be much higher as well. Um, so uh, the other problem I wanted to look at was high maintenance in those areas where we've got a uh, very soft uh, ground, uh, potentially, um, where we've got uh, we've got lots of issues of having to go back and do lots of tamping operations. Um, so how can geosynthetics help in those sort of situations? Um, so this is, as you can see from the date, this is a very old study. Um, so geogrids themselves were, were launched in 1980. Uh, so this is going on 25 years after geocells first came out, but it's still, you know, it's still a good 16 years or so ago. Um, and this is uh, an area that was uh, were requiring a lot of maintenance, a lot of tamping um, maintenance in the order of two, two or three times a year. Um, and so this area uh, with very soft formation um, had, uh, had renewal work uh, with a layer of um, geotextile separator, a geogrid, and then re-ballasting um, to, uh, to look at, at that treatment. Um, so what was the results of that? Uh, well, with this area, it was quite useful because there was an awful lot of, of information available on how that section of track was performing um, for pr prior to this this um, intervention. Um, so as you can actually see here in terms of uh, expected um, expected reduction in settlement, um, we are looking in the order of over one and a half uh, millimeters every year. So requiring a lot of intervention and, and a lot of uh, a, a lot of tamping works. Um, but what this what this track was showing that once the interface with the geogrid, was uh, was in 
we were getting substantially less overall um, deflection, which is basically indicating that we're extending those maintenance periods by as much as uh, three to four times uh, that as to prior to the installation of the geogrids. Um, how is that working? Well, it, it's, it's acting as confinement. It's stopping the ballast from laterally moving. Um, and that, uh, that extends the lifetime because we don't see the lateral movement of the ballast and it actually can improve the bearing capacity as well. Um, so I say relatively old uh, case study, but, uh, but, but uh, basically paved the way um, for the inclusion of geogrids, um, certainly um, in those areas to extend um, ballasting periods. What I would say is that if the ground conditions are poor, if you're in soft ground conditions, there is significant benefits in using geogrid reinforcement within ballast. Um, if the ground conditions are good, uh, it's it's a little not it's not quite so much benefit, um, and that's generally the case. You know, even outside rail applications for the use of geogrids, they're a lot more beneficial uh, in soft ground conditions. But this is looking at basically extending maintenance periods, as I said, in soft formations, reducing tamping. Um, in terms of thickness reductions. Um, Again, there, there are some elements where geogrids can be used to reduce the overall construction thicknesses um, for, for renewals. Uh, and it's when you have got, you've got poor, uh, poor stiffness results. Um, so, but uh, this is a, a quite a good e example. This is actually a case study from Europe. Um, it just, it, it gives some, some good uh, numbers and figures on how geogrids can be used to uh, essentially reduce the overall constructness thicknesses while give you the same um, level of, of, of performance. So we're looking at very, very soft um, subgrade formations. Um, this is a case study from, from Germany. Uh, again, very, very poor um, subgrades, as you can see there, with very low Young's modulus. And the initial design um, showed a sub ballast depth of, in excess of one meter to achieve the target values of 120 MPA. Um, the um, solution using a geogrid um, and geotextile reinforcement um, gave the same level of, uh, of stiffness of Young's modulus, the targets at the underside of ballast, but a substantial reduction in the overall thickness. Um, there's just some statements about what I've just described. Um, so what's the overall summary? Um, if you include that geosynthetic reinforcement, um, you do get a substantial reduction in aggregate excavation um, and disposal savings. So essentially you're creating this as they're a stiffer composite material. And um, as is indicated here, we essentially extrapolate that 350 mil depth saving to a one kilometer long track, at four meters wide. Uh, we can save 1,400 cubic meters of excavation and disposal, uh, approximately 108 wheel tipper truck movements. Uh, and then you can just add the same again for the amount of imported aggregate. So in terms of the benefits of using geogrid reinforcement, geosynthetic reinforcement, that's kind of showing it there. Obviously, this is very, very poor ground conditions, um, but it does it illustrate that the benefits uh, of using them from a, uh, a reduction in vehicle movements and a reduction in the amount of imported um, materials. Um, now, uh, I think one of the, uh, the drawbacks of of the one of the legacy of, of, of what happened with rail track before it was incorporated by network rail is that certain technologies that have been um, trialed and geosynthetic materials particularly ha have almost been put on the back burner um, but this is a, a case study I, 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 uh, I found out about um, which basically shows uh, the benefits of using um, geocells to essentially provide sub ballast stabilization, uh, very, very poor ground conditions. Um, they had horrendous issues with, with uh, settlement, um, very low uh, speed limits, one kilometer long section. Uh, this is going back 
back to, I think, approximately 1992, two layers of GSL were selected um, to provide a, a stabilized platform. And um, as, is, as is indicated there, once that installation had been done, they were then able to restore the line to uh, the original line speeds. Um, again, not quite so, so much in the way of monitoring um, on this particular one. So it'd be useful to know how that's performing. Um, I'm just popping this in just for completeness, just so that you can see the, uh, the installation methodology for GSLs. GSLs um, are very effective at providing full depth confinement. Um, they provide the full depth confinement, um, but uh, there potentially are some uh, longer installation times for GSLs, as is shown on some of these pictures. Uh, you've got to open the GSLs up, top fill them. Um, but just uh, illustrating there some of the, the benefits. They certainly can be used uh, as a way of, of providing so that full depth stabilization, so it can allow a, a stiffening um, of the, the formation layers. So again, just going back to that GSL, uh, that, that case study, and that was uh, following completion of the, the remedial works there. Um, so, in overall summary, I, I have just picked on a few snapshots, really, from uh, a few different case studies where geosynthetic materials have been used over the past 30 years. Um, uh, we do know that geosynthetics uh, will extend maintenance periods in the order of three times, possibly more, in very poor ground conditions, um, do reduce uh, tamping and extend the ballast life. We do know that in certain applications, um, geosynthetics can be used to reduce thicknesses um, uh, up to 50%, um, and they will, uh, without doubt, optimize the system stiffness. Um, it's, it's a twofold thing because when we're looking at things like separation geotextiles for filtration and separation, what we're trying to do is to just keep the ballast from becoming um, not so fouled, um, and that in itself will extend the life. Um, but then also the geosynthetics can be used for stabilization and reinforcement, potentially allowing the reduction in those sub-ballast thicknesses. Um, so uh, efficient track renewals, without a doubt, I and mean, there's certainly a lot of benefits uh, in the speed and time when you're talking about possession windows using geosynthetic materials. Um, now, as I said, this presentation I gave uh, on behalf of the IGS, um, so I must uh, give acknowledgments to those other contributors. Not all of the images I've shown there are Taran products. Um, so there's a, a number of companies there um, that illustrate their products too. Um, if you wanted to know a little bit more about geosynthetics, unfortunately the 9th of March is gone. Uh, April 22nd, uh, there is a, again one of these online presentations and that's about uh, carbon footprints, so the life cycle assessment of geosynthetics versus conventional and, and traditional construction methods. Um, again, a copy of this presentation will be available for reference. Uh, 4239 includes most of those geosynthetic materials that I've described, I think perhaps with the exception of the, the geocells, and there is a small element on uh, sand blanket replacement geocomposites. Um, there's also a guide to track stiffness uh, uh, 2016, which is very useful. It's got a number of those different case studies uh, relating to, to how they can benefit and improve the stiffness, or in certain situations, just that it's going to be used to reduce stiffness, but mainly improving stiffness. So um, thank you very much for listening. I, I hope you find that useful. I think there are a number of questions, so um, I don't know if you. Um, do you want to um, assist me with that, David, or? Uh... Yeah, Peter, yeah, br brilliant. Thank you for that explanation and well, highlighting some of the benefits of the, the products. Uh, yeah, so we have got just a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, on very minor time scale. So Patrick's put a question in there regarding the composite that is combined with a separating geogrid. Does the ballast manage to interlock sufficiently? when the geogrid is flush. I think that's probably what you see in most of the, the images when everything's laid down. Does yeah. that work? How does it... Yeah, that, that's that's an installation of two materials. So the sand blanket replacement geocomposite goes down first, and then the geogrid does go over the top. Um, now, the, 
the the composite material is flexible, so um, it's got high elongation, so it, it it will deflect, and the ballast will then get the opportunity to interlock into the geogrid. We did consider whether we could consider making a composite, but uh, we think from a practical perspective, it they may not be very in, uh, practical to install, and that may compromise the interlock. Okay, thank you. And we've got uh, a couple of questions regarding the rig, it seems. Uh, so Constantine, regards the, the rig, uh, what determined that three sleepers was sufficient? Why not make it uh, larger? <laughs> I don't know. Um, that, that, that's uh, A, before my time, that was Birmingham University. Okay. Uh, I guess the, the rig is pretty large as it is, um, and I guess practically you make it even bigger, it makes it more expensive, you've got to increase the loads. Um, so I, I don't know. I think there is a larger rig available in North America. I remember speaking to an academic who was in the process of doing that it could be in the future we look at that but the bigger you make these laboratory equipment the more expensive it gets to test i mean the uh, the, the 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 cost for that test alone was in the order of thirty thousand pounds so uh, i would only pay like how much um yeah a bigger bigger rig would cost uh so rob patrick's put a question about does the lab testing demo uh, does the lab testing demonstrate what performance of the sand blanket reinforcement grid will be over the entire design life of the trap bed? Um, it, it basically gave us a very good indication of how it would perform over a significant period of time. I think the test itself was in the order of four months and it was accelerated, obviously. So, um, it, it didn't, so that the composite uh, didn't have the geogrid enforcement element we were only looking at the performance of the micro filter if it prevented that clay slurry from uh, migrating and um, if it stayed intact so those were the two uh, the two things that were being looked at um, oh, sorry it's always annoying to get that happening right I don't know how to turn that off <laughs> I've got to leave that Okay, Hopefully we'll go in a minute. Um, yeah, so um, it, it, I mean that uh, that research was done um, and provided to Network Rail's pavement investigation team and was incorporated within the product acceptance um, certification process. So I, I think it was it was deemed to be an appropriate level of testing to 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 gain product acceptance. I think it would be. I'm not wishing to entirely dive the question, but I, I think uh, if it's good enough for um, Network Rail's pavement investigation team, it, it's good enough for me. Okay. All right. uh, Christopher's put a question there. Well, congr congratulations, first of all. You're very informative. Well done. Assuming that a standard ballast layer uh, is, is installed, I guess, how deep is the geotextile place? Is it lo location dependent? And if so, how do you determine the depth? And then it goes on to for a junction renewal, what sort of criteria uh, do they use, such as wet beds, GPR data, and historic yeah. information? Okay, um, I mean, depth, depths are detailed in uh, 4239, and then there's another standard, I think, which talks about ballast depth. So it will be very much dependent on the stiffness that's been generated. But from a practical and pragmatic perspective, I would say, it needs to be 300 mil below sleeper, if at all possible, given that your your tamping machines are probably extending 150, 200, I guess, below sleeper. So um, I am aware that one of those case studies said 200 mil below sleeper level, but I, I would, I know 4239 says you need, for reinstatement, you need to leave, if you've got an existing geosynthetic, you need to leave 50 mil of ballast above it for protection. Um, so I would have said 300 mil at minimum would be, would be wise. But okay. I, I don't know if you've got anybody who knows more about the, the tamping operations than I do, but I, I would have said it needs to be at least that depth to, to so it doesn't get tangled. Damage. I think it, I think it can be a little bit less. I think I think that from a tamping perspective, I think the key thing is is when you're going in to replace it again, it is making sure you're not affecting uh, the 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 geo grid or whatever you put in at the time. I think is probably the key constraint. Uh, no, well, 
Pete, uh, f thanks a lot for your time today. And obviously, you've got a, your contact details you've left on the presentation. So I, I believe you, you're happy for people to contact you uh, if you've got any further questions or support. Absolutely, no problem at all. Um, so I, it's a say. It's a quick overview in some ways, so I'm more than happy to go into a bit more detail if people need it. I mean, for me personally, it was great just, you know, explaining the benefits in those scenarios you provided and also the um, the carbon benefits and, and, and the benefit from a tra transportation perspective, just using some of these initiatives. So I don't know if I could ask the people who were uh, uh, on, online to maybe just unmute and we'll just do a quick round of applause. So thanks again for presenting, Peter. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Brilliant.